Eagle. Eagle? Yeah. It's like, oh, oh. Yeah. It's definitely not going to get that. Spelled title. different. <laughs> To your life. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, Tom Matuska here with the Matuska Tax Survey Supply Company for our Thursday Live with, this is really hard, it's a tongue twister, <laughs> with Amber Engels, Leanne Eagle, Mandy Swart, and Brett Wingfield in the background. Um, that was hard, but I did really well, didn't I? You're good. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to pick up a little bit today where we left off last week, I think last week. Um, we kind of went through the caping process just a little bit. Amber showed you how to split eyes and split ears to their extremities and um, uh, kind of flush the cape. We showed you some different tools and uh, things that we find pretty helpful. Today we're going to continue along the same route and we're going to take this mule deer which we started. This has been in the pickle and I think last week I showed you how to make a pickle using um, citric acid. We use citric acid, we use salt, water, um, we check the pH, we want a pH of two or less and uh, for a single cape like this, a five gallon bucket does it very well. Um, we're going to show you how to flush on the machine today but we from from where she left off last week we salted that hide and we let it sit till the next day I think. And then you, I don't like the hides to get too dry because they're difficult for us in the shop to get softened up. Commercial tanneries have uh, wetting agents and different uh, machinery that can agitate a hide and soften them up much faster than what we can. So we usually let them sit overnight, maybe with a fan on them, depending on the time of the year. And then they went into the, this hide went into the pickle, that citric acid pickle that I made um, last Thursday. So Friday morning went into the pickle and we pulled it out. We've continued flushing on it a little bit periodically. And today, um, I'm gonna let Amber show you how to take, I think she took off an ear um, last week. I don't know how much we showed them of that, but we, you'll show them how to take out the ear cartilage. Now, we're gonna describe, some of you like to use the Bondo method, and that's fine. If you wanna use the Bondo method, the ears still have to be split to their extremities. And um, Amber will show you that. And then also a lot of you will like to take your cartilage out and use an ear liner. So um, do you want to go ahead and show them those methods? Yeah. And uh, you can go ahead and type in any of your, text in any of your questions and we'll just keep talking as she shows you. Um, she's pretty good at taking out cartilage and without making holes. The object is, is to prep this hide and thin it without doing any more damage than the way it came in. Right, right. So to get started, we, we did already kind of turn these all the way out to the edges, and that is a really big deal. You want to make sure that if you're going to be removing cartilage that you have it turned all the way, completely all the way to the edge before trying to remove it. If you try taking the cartilage out first, it'll, and the cartilage will rip and it'll leave a little piece tucked down in between that, those two edges of ear that isn't split. So we want to make sure that we're all the way out. And just to make, to double check that, you wanna just take your fingers, I just take my fingers and run them like this over that edge. And if you feel any kind of a little roll inside of there, then you know that there's more more skin that needs to be split. So just, just by feeling that edge um, and taking a scalpel. Now, sometimes scalpels can be really dangerous up around those edges. So a lot of times what I like to do is take my scalpel and turn it, instead of running it this way with the blade to do it, I'll turn it backwards and use that tip and do more of a scraping motion. And it's still sharp, it's sharp enough to break that little connective tissue that's at the very end, but it's not as sharp as using it the other way. So it's a little bit safer method to get all the way out to the edges. And then just do a little scraping, little little chicken scratching at it and then feel it again and do that continuously all the way around until you can't feel any more rolls and you should see that the ear have a pretty good shape if you see where it kind of comes in like this or does something funny if your ear was was looking like it was like this inside of there well you know is that is that how skinny a deer ear is nope that you know and if you feel you should feel that there's still a pretty good width to that um 
another little telltale sign is you'll see these little these little pock marks in the cartilage. When you start to see those, that's kind of like a little warning sign, I guess, that you're getting close getting to close, the edge. Yeah. Yep. So it's kind of, and there are a few little right here. There's a there's a notch where there was a, a notch in the ear. I usually will split those some mm -hmm. you know because when they're really small it'd be very difficult to get down and get that split without splitting it so i would rather just get it all the way split and then just throw in a few stitches and get it sewn so we're going to remove the cartilage now that this has all been split to the edge so i'll take this ear and i'm going to bend it over in half and then i already kind of started a score line we're going to score across this cartilage using our scalpel and you want to be careful because that skin's directly on the other side of that cartilage. So we don't want to cut through the skin on the front side. So it's just kind of scoring through nice and easy. And you'll see that cartilage make a split when you do it. And be careful when you get further out here to this side of the ear, the cartilage gets thinner. So you'd want to be a little bit more ginger about how hard you're pushing. And you should be able to see that, that skin of the cartilage or of the inner ear start to show through. Okay, so now that that's cut, we should be able to come in here. And I always tell, tell students that it's good to have fingernails. Um, oh, yeah. For when you're doing ears, you don't have to have girly fingernails, but you, it's helpful to have a little bit of fingernail, just enough to be able to get a hold of that cartilage. It'll make your life much easier. Taxidermists that chew their fingernails are gonna have difficulty getting the cartilage out. Yeah. Yep, yep. And you can kind of see, it's it shouldn't be a real rigorous motion. Um, the upper part of the ear will come off pretty easy. And you can kind of see, I'm not pulling away from the edges. I'm not holding the ear back here and pulling because then we'll, like I just did, we will end up popping the side of the ear. So we want to be careful about how you hold it. Don't pull against those sides and just kind of nice and easy roll it up. And also I don't try to rush this process too much. If you go too fast and you just go and rip it right off, most likely you're going to end up seeing hair and skin on this side of the cartilage and you'll pull um, some of the hair through from the other side. So I like to take my time so I can keep an eye on if there's little hairs that start showing up on this, I'm, I'm gonna slow down and stop and say, whoa, okay, we need to fix that before it turns into a hole. And then sometimes up around here, a little bit will be left on there. So again, you can just kind of pick at it, get it started again, and get that whole cartilage off all the way around. I've been painting today, so I got dirty fingernails. It probably doesn't look the greatest. <laughs> and the so. grain runs the length of the ear, so going sideways sometimes can be dangerous too. Right. Yep, try to move it in an up and down motion and again just holding on to that ear real firm and then just kind of rolling sometimes i'll even get both thumbs in there and kind of use them to push up against each other but just kind of take it nice and easy don't try to rush this too too crazy And as you're getting down further and further and further down into the ear, it is going to get harder to remove, but we're gonna want to, ideally, we want to remove this cartilage all the way down to this ridge right here. That's where a lot of the, the inner ear mm -hmm. bumps start. So ideally, that's where we like to bring it down to. And there's different... Sure, you can, I mean, there's ear inserts you can use. You can take all of the cartilage off. Um, some people cut it off short and we used to rebuild the inner ear canal with mm -hmm. epoxy with flesh colored epoxy down in there um, um, A few competitions ago. I left my inner ear cartilage in Wondering if I could get away with it and uh, the comment from the judge was nice inner ear detail 
and it was a shortcut. And that's what started us leaving the last inch of cartilage because it holds the, as the ear narrows down into the canal, it kind of holds that shape and it's pretty convincing for customers. Okay, so I've got it pushed all the way down here and it'll come, when, once it hits those ridges on the inside of the ear, it's just gonna stop you. You won't be able to pull it off very easy. So it'll, once you hit a big old stop, you won't be able to pull it any further. So you know you're far enough. And I'm just by kind of feeling, I can feel I'm right down in there. So now we're going to take, and we're gonna just remove this top part of the cartilage and leave this bottom part and we'll mount it with that bottom part in there. So now we'll just kind of take it. I'm watching, so because I don't want to cut that skin, I'm just going to cut through the cartilage. And you can do this with the scissors too. It doesn't have to be done with a knife. Something about like that. Good job. A little bit of a fix it there. <laughs> um, and that's what you. That's what you want to do. This skin is really nice and thin, split all the way to the edges. We've got a couple little, here's the little um, fork or little cut in the ear that we need to fix. Um, we have a little one over on this side somewhere. Now, if you, like she said, don't take shortcuts. If you take a shortcut and don't get the cartilage all the way out, when you glue your ear liner in, the ear liner does not extend into the end of the ear tip. Um, I did one of the first life sizes I ever did. Thank goodness it was for myself. Um, I had a big white tailed deer that I bought from the conservation that got hit on the road. And uh, I knew when I take, took the cartilage out, I didn't get it all the way to the end. I knew when I was test fitting my airliners, I have to come back and get that little three quarters of an inch. I never did when I glued the airliners in on the final mount. I knew I didn't get it in as far as it had to go. And sure enough, a month later, my ears started curling over and it ruined the entire mouth. So no shortcuts. Yep. Um, the next thing we're gonna do with this, I think we left a, he's been machine fleshed and I left a spot here to show you what the flushing machine does. Now, remember last week we said, when you get to a certain point, when you get to that salted deer hide, um, you have two choices tan it yourself or send it to the commercial tannery. Lots of good commercial tanneries out there. Um, just talk to some, you know, tax service in your area or when you go to the shows, you know, talk, visit with people and they'll point you in the right direction. But um, you can't tan your own hides without a, without a flushing machine. It's imperative to have a flushing machine. You have to thin this hide two thirds of its original thickness. If you do not thin this hide enough, you will not get the hide back to the original size. The cape will not go as big as he was. Um, it will not stretch. It will draw back. Thick leather will give you all kinds of fits. It's really imperative that this is taken down minimum of two thirds of the original thickness. Very, very thin. Thin, th we always say thin to win, thin to win. Um, up in the face, this all had to be done by a knife. Knife, skyf knife. Um, whatever tools that you, you know, find useful. You know, there's mini flesh awls, there's Skype knives, there's a little beam. We, we make these things are pretty handy and, and we'll uh, stick the areas that we can't access on the machine. We'll stick it over here and we'll flush that with either a Skype knife or, or our Chicago cutlery knives. But um, now remember if you're going to the tannery, that's not necessary, get off the fat and meat um, get them cleaned up as good as you can. Salt them. Remember, um, two pounds of salt rubbed in is way better than 20 pounds of salt dumped on. Right. Um, then salt them, and after they've dried, you can get them into a box and send them to the tannery, and they're come, gonna come back. We showed you last week, you can mark either wet tan or dry tan. Um, both methods work for tax service. And, uh, but if you're gonna tan these yourself, you have to flush them on a machine. Over here, we have, uh, have an assortment of machines we're very fortunate um, to have in our you know, shop. We got four of them, five of them I think we have now. Uh, this is American Eagle um, in a zombie green color made out of Wisconsin. This is a beautiful machine. Uh, 
very fine tuned, um, very you know intricate settings. Sets with a with a set screw with a hex uh, Allen wrench. Um, you've got probably about a half inch of clearance for the blade. Um, a very fine machine, set up on a nice plastic top, like a cutting board type top. This is um, a Quebec that H and H Machine Shop rebuilt. Um, I've had Quebecs forever, and um, this machine is 40 years old. You know, it's an old machine. Um, looks brand new, thanks to H and H. Um, this is the, um, I think it's the SNS flushing machine um, that sold by the tannery, H and H tannery, and this is a great machine too. So we've got a lineup of three of them. All, all of them have a little bit different characteristics. This one's a little bit higher on the machine. If I use this one, I have to stand on the box because I got to lower my legs. Um, this one is the one I'm most used used to, and uh, the American Eagle is. I mean, they all work very, very well. They. They run by, um, they spin, the blade is very sharp on one edge. The, the edge is like this. This is the sharpened edge over here. As it spins, it goes like so, and you're gonna drag the hide from on ours left to right. If you wanted to do the opposite direction, you can switch your blade around, that will work also. As it spins, these guards are gonna keep your hands out of the blade. And uh, everybody wants, everybody um, adjusts their blades to different, you know, whatever works for them. Ours um, cuts kind of right about in here. And that's where all of ours are set in, just because I'm used to that. So I'm gonna take that uh, cape and I'm gonna fire up the machine. I'll give you a little, a small tutorial on sharpening. They'll come with sharpening steels. Uh, these are the kind that come with the machine. My favorite is a black diamond uh, that we have made for us. This is a, a tungsten carbide fleshing stick, and it's pointed. Now, a lot of people will send you two, two sharpeners, one for underneath, one for on top. Um, these are a little more expensive. You only need one. We're gonna use it underneath, and then we're gonna bring it on the top. So. As the blade is spinning, I'm gonna take this point, I'm gonna stick it under here, and I'm gonna twist it until I hear the pitch change. Once I hear the pitch change, I know that I brought that edge up. Now I'm going to come across the top, and I'm gonna bring that edge back down, and I have no idea where it's gonna cut the first time. If I do it level with the table, I'm gonna say that it's gonna cut maybe a little on the shallow side. So I'm gonna take my first swipe. If it doesn't cut where I want it to, um, I'm either gonna bring it up slightly or I'm gonna bring it down slightly. And as you put the, the fleshing stick on the blade, you don't wanna be wobbling back and forth. You just can put it on and tilt it down or tilt it up. So I will start the blade, I'll start the blade and I'm gonna show you how I would adjust these um, the fleshing steel, I'm going to adjust the lip of the blade just to see um, what it does. And then I'm going to take a couple test, test swipes. Now, usually I'll have either a practice hide um, that I can practice on so you don't hurt anything or uh, maybe a thicker piece of the hide that you're using on. If you're inexperienced, have several practice pieces that you can test. So I'm going to take the point. Stick it right under the edge, and you're going to hear the you're going to hear the pitch change. Now I brought that edge up. Now I'm going to bring it back down. Now I should be about level. I'm going to bring it up just a little. And now we have no idea where it's going to cut, so I'm going to take the place off of the cape where I don't hurt anything. This would be off, off the cape, so I'm just gonna off the form. And I grab it. My favorite way is to present a large flat surface to the blade. And 
Now I've just, I've taken a nice layer off of here. Now we're gonna see up in here. I, I left this for you. Got lots of flesh here. And you can see what it took off. The longer swipes you take, the smoother your fleshing job is gonna be. Now, if you're pulling hard into the guards, um, either your guards aren't adjusted properly. I, I like to have this guard out the farthest, then the blade, and then this guard is set back a little bit. So I encounter this guard, the blade sticks out just a fraction of an inch, um, I would say a 64th, and then the um, back guard sticks out a little bit farther. Um, yes, now here's something that is critical for good taxidermy work and to be able to sew things up easily. Notice how thin that edge is right here. You can stick any kind of needle through there all day long without hurting your fingers. It's very easy because that's so thin. The way I get it that thin is I put my hair, here's my hair, put my hair down to the table and I can run that edge right on this plate. Now, because the hair's down and the blade's going like this, the hair doesn't get sucked in and it doesn't get cut off. So I will spend a little bit of time going around the entire perimeter of that cake, the seam, and make sure that I get that, that edge really nice and, nice and thin because with an edge this thin, you can sew it up like butter. I mean, it'll sew up really easy. And with an edge that thin, your stitches will not pull apart. So we'll do a couple more swipes up in this thick area. Then we'll turn it over to Amber, who's gonna show you how to fix some, maybe bullet holes or fleshing cuts, self-inflicted damage that maybe you did, or the hunter did, or the deer had. I like to flesh my hides, um, I say three times. So my first one is to get the majority of the meat and the flesh off of the skin. My second one, this I call my second one, is a much neater flesh job. Um, I spent more time, I got it way thinner. I can see the, the blueness of the leather coming through of the hair side. Um, my third one is gonna be just a touch up. I'm gonna get any little areas like that I think I missed. Here's a chunk like that. I would get that on my next time through. Um, and by the time you've gone over it three good times, it should be about ready for tanning. Um, a lot of times we have students, they said, I've done it three times, so it's gotta be done. If you, or gotta be completed. Um, if you don't do the first one good enough, it's going to take 10 times. If you didn't do the second one good enough, it's going to, you know, you have to have three, three really good flushings. And you, you put it in, in the pickle, in between those flushings? In between flushings, um, now this, this seems very thin to me. By putting it back into the pickle, like we do them in batches, so we might have a dozen capes in the pickle, by putting it back in the pickle, working on another one, this one will actually swell up just slightly. Um, it, it gets full and poofy, and it makes another fleshing way easier, and you can get your, your thinness of your leather way down to where it's really manageable. You want, um, if you've ever mounted a deer, and you adjust the bottom eyelid and the top of the scalp moves, that's because your skin is way too thick around here. So, no matter how you do it, if you, 
use a knife or a scythe knife or a mini flesh awl or a big flesh and rotary flesh and wheel like this, somehow everything on here has to be thinned. Um, if it's not thinned, you're gonna fight the mounting process. Uh, properly shaved cape um, is really nice to mount on, you know, really easy to mount on. And nice and evenly flush too, because if there's big dips and whatnot um, from fleshing, sometimes can that be visible? Um, uneven fleshing, I think it shows up like wrinkles and stuff like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now at some point you need to repair these hides and uh, that's an important part. You want to, you know, every hide is going to have something. I mean, rarely do we get one in that we don't have to fix up. A scar is on. Brett was working on a um, Sitka blacktail today and um, it was the most beautiful cape ever and it just had some big blems. And by spending five minutes here, ten minutes here, um, you can fix that and make it look very, very nice. So why don't you show them a little bit about sewing. All right, so the first thing I like to do is before I even get carried away, I like to flip it over and take a look because a lot of times, even if there isn't a hole through the hide, it might even just be, like you said, kind of a, a scab or things like that where it didn't even penetrate all the way through the hide and it leaves bad unsightly looking marks in the hide. Now some customers like this and some taxidermists like to leave this. It's, it's kind of up to you, but we do like to take a look at the hide um, no matter what to just know what we're dealing with. Um, if it's major, kind of check with the customer because if it were a great big, you know, black bear boar and he's got a big scar across his nose, um, that's character for that animal and it right. might be a real prestigious thing for that cape. Um, you know, a fence burn or something like that on an antelope, you know, you take that out, you can make it really look per perfect, and some people like it, some people don't, so. And if that's something Check. that you can notice when you take the animal in, that's always a good thing, and just notice notches in the ears, and that's a good time to ask the customer right away if, uh, if that's something they want left in or if it's something they want removed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I like to come through the face and I'm just kind of combing it all out and just seeing if any of those, any blems show up in the hide that might give us a little bit of a warning sign of scars that, that might not even be a hole through to the other side. Once I've kind of combed through it and have an idea of, oh, there's one there. Nope, I don't see any. Then we can flip it over and worry about holes. Mm -hmm. Brad Odom wants to know if we're gonna be at the world show. We are going to have a monstrous presence at the World Show. We will. And make sure you stop by. I was just doing some math today, and we have over $3,000 of giveaways to give out. It's a big deal. There's some nice, nice things. And the more you spend at the Matuska booth over any other booth, the more chances you have at that $3,000 giveaway. And we're, our booth's more Takes fun money anyway. to make money. That's right. <laughs> So make sure you stop by and see that. And we'll have live seminars going on the whole time. We'll have different demos with uh, the Sharpen Air if you want to see it, or things like that, the Pan Pastels, the Pearlex. Um, Amber's going to be painting some rocks and doing some habitat stuff. Um, all sorts of fun stuff going on in our booth. Brett's so going to be doing by. painting too? It's going to be the Matuska World within the World Tax Show. That's right. Yeah. And it's. I'm not sure who's going to be bigger. And for those that aren't going to be able to make it, just make sure you're like and follow us on Facebook because we will be going live and you will feel like you're there. And I also saw that, saw that Kathy Breakthrough, if you go to their Facebook Don't page, push. yes, they're going to be going live for the um, banquet. So you'll be able to catch the whole banquet if you can't make it live on their Facebook page. Okay, so I'm looking here and there's not a whole lot of body holes on this. I usually start with the body first, um, just personal preference um, to kind of get me going because some of your finer sewing and your much better detailed sewing should be done on your face. So I like to break myself in doing the body first. Um, this is one of the holes that we got on our body and you can kind of see here how that skin is ultra, ultra thin. 
up and around that cut. You can kind of see where it's really, really, really thin skin. So when we talk about fixing holes, it's not just taking the initial hole as it is and sewing it up. There's all sorts of different things to consider as far as Looks like if a flushing machine hole. We would sew. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna if, say that we're, yeah. <laughs> if we were gonna sew that up and leave it as it was there might be loss of hair and actually there is a little bit because that skin got so thin right there that it wasn't able to even hold the hair roots and so there's a little bit of hair loss around there if we would sew that bold skin and leave that on your stitch no matter how pretty your stitches are you're still going to see that hole. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we remove all the excess area that's bad. So to do that, I usually will take a, this is the one thing that I didn't grab, get it. Um, a number 11 scalpel. I like the number 11s are really nice and pointy. And we're going to take and poke a bunch of holes, almost per, put a bunch of perforations through the hide from the hair side. And that's going to help us kind of map out where the bad skin is that needs to be removed. And we would do the same thing, no matter what kind of hole you have, no matter where it's at, it's always important to, you know, find the hole on this side, but flip the hide back over to the other side to see what kind of damage is happening on this side. Um, a lot of times you'll have cut hair. Sometimes if it's a scar, it'll be just a hole right there, but you'll find a big old scar that comes up here or a slip spot. Um, burnt hair, all sorts of different things. So we really want to check out and see what's going on on this side of the hide because that's the side you're going to see. So there's not a lot of bald skin up around this hole, but there is just enough that if I'm going to maybe be footballing this out and, and sewing this up, I might as well get it all. So I'm just going to go right here along where that hairline is and just make a bunch of little, little pokes that kind of show us where we need to make sure we remove. And you don't have to go way in, but I'm just kind of making a little outline. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be in any shape. So that way, when we flip it over here and you look at it, there's a bunch of little holes. And of course, with this, we can see it. But if there was cut hair or things like that that we need to remove, you wouldn't be able to see what areas need to be gone. And to sew up a hole, some of your holes are gonna be big and round. Some of them are gonna be really misshaped and, and not a pretty kind of a thing. So we like to take and football, football them out is how we term it, I guess. Turn it into more of a football shape. So if you have a hole that's all oblong, we could figure out what would be the best way if we tried cutting it out and sewing it together this way, we'd have to make a much bigger hole, where if we turned it this way, we wouldn't have to make it so far. So if we would just take and sew that up, what would happen is you'd have your hide, and then it would have a lip up, and then another lip up, and then a hole. And right here would be your stitches. If you would take a round hole or a misshapen hole like that and try to sew it, it wouldn't lay flat. It would leave these two little nipple-like points on the ends of those so marks. So in order to fix that, we're going to take this shape and we're going to turn it into a shape that will sew together better. So to do a hole like that, I would come back here and remove. So you're actually cutting out a much bigger area to make it lay nicer. Right. And sometimes you'll end up even doubling the size of the hole, which makes a lot of people panic. Oh, I'm making the hole bigger. But to, in order to get that sewn up, this is gonna be a much, much prettier stitch than if you would try to sew up the hole as is. And some holes kind of come together on their own. You don't have to change the shape, but some of them you do, especially when you have cut hair and different things like that. Um, sometimes, you know, if you look at the, at the hole through the other side, you'll end up with a hole that's only this big, and then you'll find you've got cut hair all around it that gets that big. Now you gotta make a hole that big. So. Um, just really make sure that you're looking, that cut hair will show even if it's just a few. And check with your customer too when the, when the deer comes in or whatever animal it is. Um, it could be an arrow hole going through the neck. Yeah. Um, bullet hole, entrance and exits. You may have 
two holes in the neck, and every hole you take out of the neck or repair probably diminish the neck size. And neck size on especially white tail is super prestigious to our hunters, our customers. So yep. the more you have to take out, the smaller you're gonna make it. And talking about neck size, that can also kind of be helped a little bit in the direction that you're cutting out stuff. So if we've got a hole up here in the neck, down in the body, it doesn't seem to affect as much because there's usually, it's enough not, circumference, yeah, yeah, enough circumference to make it around without having to change your stitches. But when you get up here into, up into your neck area, it gets real tight and you could actually be taking away inches from your neck. So in order to try and preserve that, if we've got a hole here, I, instead of going up and down with our stitches, I would prefer to football it out and go widthwise with our stitches. I would prefer to do something like that versus up and down. That way we're taking the width and pinching it together here and not shortening up the width on our neck because the more and more holes you do, all of a sudden you could be an inch or two shorter mm -hmm. on your neck. How Smaller. do you fix splits in the ear cartilage? Splits in the ear cartilage. If you want it to disappear, we open up the entire ear. Um, It'd be like this. Like this one is opened up, up and across. This one was a notch right here. So you can kind of see there's a V shape. So we open it all the way up. And then he's drawn a picture of it there. So if you have a ear like that, a lot of times I think what you're talking about is you have split this out to the edge, past the edge, right? Uh, here mm -hmm. and here, yep. and this can carefully be sewn, the back of the ear can be sewn to the other side of the back of the ear, mm -hmm. and then you go to the inside, and the inside can be sewn the same, and now you made a normal ear out of a split ear. Yep. So, so there's that way to fix it, but sometimes people want that split left in, in which case we split that out, take the cartilage out, split this out, take the cartilage out, now you have this um, turn inside out, or if you want to split it out like you did, like you're talking about, you can sew this, sew this, and when you put your ear liner in, you'd lay this on your ear liner, and you would cut that portion of the ear liner out. Yep. So right here, if you were going to get rid of that notch, we would it's just start sewing from this side, and then sew up that V, and then back down. See that? Oh. And then if you were going to leave the notch, you would turn your ear to the side like this, tuck that hair in, and then proceed to sew from one from the front side to the back side, down, and then back up that notch. And that would leave that notch in the ear. And like, like Tom just said, you would have to remove part of that ear liner in order to get that to fit in there and test fit it and then remove the piece that, that lines up on that. AJ wants to know, can you bring your own deer to your company to have stuffed from your guys? Yes. So if you go to our Matuska Tax Room Studio Facebook page, that would be our studio portion. You're watching the supply company. And then we also have Northwest Iowa School of Tax Room where you can come and learn it. Now, the more effort you put into repairing your deer, flushing your deer, thinning your lips, thinning your nose, then learning how to mount them like a professional, um, you'll start turning out really, really, really pretty products. Mm -hmm. And in the when you're first new to doing a lot of this footballing, it's not a bad idea to grab a permanent marker. Um, I always suggest this to people who aren't used to doing a lot of this, and even just draw it out on your hide. That won't hurt the hide at all, and just give yourself something to look at, because as you're sitting there pulling on this hide, you can distort it quite a bit and make it so you lose where you're actually initially wanting to cut. So now we want to be careful how we come at this with the scalpel, because we're trying to keep the hair, not, not make any more cut hair, so we're just going to lightly come through here, start cutting very carefully until we make a little tiny hole. And I'm keeping the tip of the knife so it's not going through to the hair side. Now, Cut hair is your enemy. Cut hair will show. Yeah. Once you get it going, 
you can even get your finger in there or get a hold of that hide and then it makes it much easier to be able to cut. So I've got, no, the number 11 was for poking the holes because so this is too big. Yeah, I usually use a number 22, but you could use an 11 for the entire process. That'd be fine. Um, now the next thing you want to look at before you start sewing is the thickness of the hide. This right here is actually pretty thin. We're not going to have to worry about it too much, but sometimes you'll get holes that have big, whopping, huge, thick edges. Mm -hmm. And again, you can do the prettiest sew job in the world. And if you're trying to sew up that big, thick hide, it's not going to hide very well. It won't be very pretty. So now once we make that cut and we pull on that seam, look at how nice and pretty that lays right together. And there's no bumping up on the edges. If you see it doing some kind of a funny bubble up on the edges, well, you might wanna come back and make your football a little bit longer. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and sew. And there's all sorts of different threads. Do you wanna talk about some of the different threads, Tom? I can do it. Um, sometimes color is an issue. We have white threads, dark threads, brown threads, hot green threads. Um, in this area, down by the brisket, color is not going to be of any issue whatsoever. Nope. So, um, it's long hair. We need something strong that's going to um, hold it together as it dries. Um, oftentimes, especially on bird work, we use serger thread like this. This is just cotton thread that you can get at Walmart. It has no strength whatsoever. My rule is the thread has to be stronger than the material you're sewing. Um, this is not very strong. That is gonna be much stronger. Um, we used to use a lot of dental floss. Dental floss is a very strong thread and I think it breaks at maybe almost 30 pounds. Um, very strong, it's waxed and it's flat. I've sewed up a lot of animals with dental floss. Um, you can get it in larger con um, spools like this. Dental floss is a great one. Um, also, as you're checking on what kind of thread to use, check the elasticity. You don't want a bunch of tensile stretch. Um, I can pull dental floss, not a lot. Now, if I were to take fishing line, a lot of people use fishing line. This is called invisible thread. Um, I can stretch this like a bungee cord. If the thread stretches like rubber, as that leather dries, it's gonna put pressure on that thread and you're gonna have an air gap right down the middle. Um, one of our favorite that we use here um, is Fireline. And there's a lot of different fishing lines. This is made in our hometown here. Fireline has zero stretch. It's extremely thin. This is eight pound test. Um, we use four, six, eight, ten. Um, if if you're sewing up something like a moose and the eight pound is too thin, it, it uh, cuts through your leather, go ahead and fold it. You can do a double double stretch. Um, or if you needed eight and all you have is four, go ahead and do double threads. But we like um, we like Fireline. It's very strong. Yep. And this, well, we can also talk about needles, I guess, at the same time, too. I kind of got a whole variety, a little buffet set up here of different kinds of needles. Sometimes in fragile areas, we use a regular round cloth sewing needle, yep. um, like this guy. And I would use that on ears, lips, eyelids. It doesn't make, it makes nothing more than a little puncture hole. It is going to be very hard to push through areas down here because that leather is too, too thick and puncturing that through is gonna be hard. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we use a three-cornered Glover's needle. Now there's there's mm -hmm. surgical needles and Glover's needles. Glover's needles typically aren't coated. They're not nickel plated or chrome plated or anything like that. Glover's needles are sharper, but Glover's needles will also tarnish and corrode. Mm -hmm. So Glover's needles, if you don't take care of them, are good for a one or two time deal. Um, this is a, look at how easy that pokes through that leather. I'm not putting any pressure on at all. This is a three cornered, um, three cutting edge needle. <coughs> and uh, it cuts as it goes in. It's a little too um, obtrusive to work on, you know, ears and lips and eyelids. Mm -hmm. um, I'd use the round one for that, but it's great for any of the body. Um, this is um, a little half curved needle. 
You like these, don't you? I do. Those are, um, the half curve ones are, are my favorite, but everybody's got their own thing. These twisted my puny little fingers, so yeah. they don't work so hot for me. Okay. Um, but that's one you can grab a hold of, and it's already curved up, kind of like a ski, like a toboggan, mm -hmm. and you can The key to down. using those is to keeping your finger up on the edge, up here. A lot of people want to sew down here, and then when you put it into the hide, it's going to spin. It'll spin around and jab you. So if you keep your finger up here, get it started, push it through, get it started, push it through. That's There's a lot of different needles. So if many. you ever go to a, get stitches and you see the noodle, needles and the stitches that the doctors use, they wouldn't make very good tax <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. That's bad stitching. Uh, here is uh, an S needle. And uh, we use these a lot of times for sewing up the back of our deer. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can grab onto. A heavy moose cape or an elk cape where you need some leverage, um, you can put it in your fingers, you can grab onto it and really get a good grip on that needle. Lots of different needles. Um, Competition-wise, would you say smaller needle the better? All the time. The, the more intricate the area you're sewing, smaller needle, smaller thread, closer stitches are going to give you a neater seam. Mm -hmm. um, Longer hair, thicker, thicker leather. You can go with a little bit heavier thread. Um, we always used to use this. This was a um, actually a bow string, and it's waxed very much like the dental floss. We use this for years for everything. Um, it tends to give you a stitch that you can feel. Um, we only used it on the back of deer. We didn't use it much for repairs. Um, we used it on moose and elk and that sort of thing. That's our cape thread. Cape thread, yes. And it can be a little bit more manageable to sew with than this because because that wax thread grabs the height mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it doesn't try to back, the stitches don't try to back out as you continue to sew. They kind of, once you pull them, they kind of stay. And be careful as you're sewing, don't pull your stitches. You want them tight, you want the leather to come together, you don't want it to stretch back out, but don't pull so hard that you pucker the stitches. Right. Um, too tight of stitches will you're, you're gonna feel it. I think I got yelled at for doing said two tight of stitches once. Not by you, Tom. Oh. <laughs> All right, so here we go. We've got, uh, we've got a hole right here. And we're gonna go ahead. I've got a double thread on this. And I'll use double thread on the body. It's just kind of a personal preference. So you don't have to. You could use, You could use a single thread and that'd be just fine. So we're gonna start off by just coming in making your your first area here. And to, to start a stitch with the double thread, I usually will just go through and then find your loop through the end of there and just go through. Now it is attached to that hide. I don't have to sit there and tie it onto the hide, so it makes it go a little bit faster for me. And I usually do like to put my finger down and hold on to that little tag so it doesn't roll around to the hair side. And you wanna keep your stitches pretty close to the edge. You don't want them way out in here making big, huge whopping stitches. And when I'm doing this, I'm trying not to come in. If we come under here and get a whole bunch of hair up in our stitch, that's gonna push that hair to the side and it's gonna make that stitch more visible. So when, you, when you're sewing, try to come underneath the hide, but not over a whole bunch of hair. And consistency is the key. Um, consistency with your width of stitches, how far out apart they are. I usually don't go real far without pulling, so I'll usually make three or four stitches and then just give it a nice tug. And you can pinch it with your fingers and sometimes that'll help keep you from over tightening. Derek Wank is watching from Cancun, Mexico. Yeah. On hmm. vacation. And that's he's gonna have a good old a tan next week. Character issue. If you <laughs> <laughs> if there's not enough to do in Mexico <laughs> that you have to watch us, I'm not sure. He didn't say he wasn't poolside with a drink in his hand. Yeah, I think they have swim up bars. Yep. He's probably and letting everybody in watch. Denison, I never used a needle to poke a hole in your pop can. It's <laughs> usually a scalpel blade. Trickster. <laughs> Now don't repair 
Don't make all your repairs on your hide if you're gonna put it back over the flushing machine because you're gonna cut out your stitches. So make sure all machine flushing um, is finished before you start the repair. And then this will be my last stitch. Come through. And I just kind of feel and make sure that there isn't any gapping. When you put some pressure on those stitches, you should not see air or light or hair or anything through there. They should be nice and tight pulled together. And now to tie the knot, I'm just gonna kind of come through right next to that stitch, almost like doing that stitch twice. And now it creates a loop right here. And we're gonna come through that loop and it makes a knot. Huh. Tie it up real nice. I usually put my thumb on it. And then to tie that, and then I usually do like to do some backup stitches or some backup knots just to make sure that that knot doesn't slip. That one is still susceptible to slip. So I'm just gonna take my fingers and wrap it around, make another loop, come through, spread my fingers and then put my thumb on it. Once you do this, it'll just kind of become rhythm and and I usually will do it at least two times, sometimes three, if I'm in a crazy area. And yeah, then, it doesn't do any good to yeah. do a beautiful stitch if it's going to oh, slip man. when you're putting it on. I can't tell you how much that happens for, for a lot of people, and that's frustrating. Um, another thing that people do is they like to come through and cut their, their thread right next to their knot. And again, you know why? It's going to be underneath. Mm -hmm. I, I don't try to cut it right next to. I'll leave anywhere from a half an inch, three quarters of an inch little tag hanging off there, just in case and it does budge. If you're using Fireline, Fireline is susceptible to sliding against itself. So um, we usually take a couple extra knot precautions just to make sure that it doesn't right. you know, slip, because it's slippery stuff. Right, kind of like when starting, when starting this too, um, I'll come through and instead of only making one knot, I usually go through three times magic number and pull it nice and tight to make that initial mm -hmm. knot so it's good and strong and that way there isn't any slipping. We have giveaway winners. Um, make sure you like and share and tag this video for your chance to win. Last week I think we had 55 shares and so we picked two winners and the first one to chime in and let us know that you're watching what were we gonna, oh, we're gonna let them win a new shirt. Oh, a new Brett's, shirt. Brett's wearing our new taxidermy shirt. Let's see it, Brett. So Craig Sloan or Adam Saint Saunders? Craig Sloan or Adam Saunders? Whichever one of you is watching. Let's see the back. What's the back say, Ooh, Dad? Back. Taxidermy, Greek word taxi, to move, derma, a skin. The art of preserving and preparing a skins of animals with lifelike effect for the purpose of education, display, or study. So one of you are the lucky winner if you chime in and let us know you're watching. If not, it will go to a lucky live viewer. Do you got anything else? Next week, um, this hive, we're going to... No. Um, no. Now, be, oh no, next no. week's no. the world. Thanks, no. guys. <laughs> Next week we will have nothing to do with this hide. <laughs> okay. Next week we might have a baby. Yeah, oh yeah. not Mandy. Oh, but we, we got two babies coming here. Oh, yeah. We couldn't have a regular maternity board. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to take uh, EMT classes or whatever we have to take. Um, next week we'll be at the World, and then when we come back we will. We'll continue, continue on, and we'll right now because we've started sewing on this hide, we will get this hide completely ready to neutralize and tan. So the next thing we're gonna do is we'll put it in the freezer over the next week until we get back to you. And then we're gonna take it out, check it over real good, we'll show it to you. We're gonna show you how to neutralize this hide. We're gonna show you how to tan it using True Bond 1000, an excellent, excellent tanning material um, that we've had huge success with and use it all the time in the shop and um, how to tan them. We like to stretch them and dry them, but we'll show you some other um, alternative methods of, of getting them ready to mount. Um, and probably maybe do some measuring so we can check it for <coughs> form for what our measurements were when we first caped it out. We want to double check all of that thing. Okay, so we did not have Adam Saunders or Craig Sloan chime in. So, lucky viewers, start guessing 
and we will give away a free t-shirt um, one through 40 go ahead and start guessing now and why you do that I did have a question do you sew the same way down the neck of the mannequins I do um, it's, baseball it's a baseball stitch um, I do most of the repairing every now and then if you're pre sewing up a stitch up the back a whip stitch can be really nice but Really, those are the two stitches that I stick mm -hmm. with. Is that about the same with you, Tom? I, I've tried so many stitches over the years, and I've had some real crafty stitches. It made me think like I was a real seamstress, but I always resort back to my baseball stitch, almost. Yep. Always. Now, you um, notice also on this cape, not to interrupt you, um, this cape was, was split all the way down the back. That's how it came to us. Um, if that's the case and you want to mount a tube cut deer, um, you can lay this out and sew it up like right now um, so that when you mount this deer, you're actually mounting a tube cut. Yep. Keep guessing, I haven't seen it yet, but why you're guessing, um, Brent Dennison. Oh. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Brent Dennison, you uh -huh. <laughs> One, a free t-shirt. You better That's watch your podcast. good winner. Yeah. There's a needle in it. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of fun announcements, too. We have a sale that I'll announce at the end, so stay tuned for that. Make sure to like and share this video for your chance to win. Next week, we'll do it live at the World. Um, we, Pan Pastels, everyone's going crazy. Everyone likes our kit, so we kind of decided to uh, keep adding. So, we have new kits that we have added and they are in stock now. We're taking them to the world. Um, so they'll be there, but this is our, um, let's see. This is a Detail Colors Open Mouth Kit. I don't know if you wanna take them out and show them the colors. We also have a Habitat Kit, the Rock Face Colors. We have Reptile Kit with the base colors. We have an African kit with your African. There's, this one's the prettiest kit I think we have. The saltwater fish kit. And then on top of that, we did a cat kit, which would be your bobcat. Bobcats, mountain lion noses. And what's nice about this one is it's a five piece. So it's half the size and half the amount of money Oh, I like that. Yeah, and so you get, and you get tools. So it comes with um, a little sponge and two applicators where the larger kits come with uh, a long applicator with some different tips and then the smaller one. And here's the salt work kit. Very pretty. So make sure to check those out. They are not online. I am too busy with this world show to put them online. So you will have to call in and our lovely assistants on the phone will help you and walk you through. Not only do we have these kits, but we have gotten requests for other colors. We have added about 18 to 20 new single colors. So ask them and those will be available as well. Um, look at what the detail that you can get. This is a bobcat nose that Amber did with um, the colors from the cat kit. Kit cat, is that a candy bar? Hmm. Um, Super easy because anybody who's airbrushed um, anybody can do it. noses, you know, sometimes, you, you know, it, it takes good, good control of your airbrush and sometimes you'll end up doing it a couple times because you, oh, oh man, and then you go back and do it again. So you can wipe it off. It's user friendly. There's no, no solvents. There's no expensive compressors. Nope. Um, it's just a. Uh, and the detail is just phenomenal. You can get in there and do those little specks that in yeah. different uh, That's as good markings. as a bobcat nose I've ever seen. Um, Great control. Brent Dennison, you are the winner. And then we are offering True Bond for those um, of you that use True Bond. This is an awesome tanning mm -hmm. line. Anybody and that tans their own hides needs to use True Bond. And we are using, we are offering 25% off the True Bond products starting tonight. So take advantage of that. That's a great deal. Um, we'll also have them at the show for you if you're going to be at the World Show. And make sure next week to come stop by and see us and talk to us and hang out with our team. Mm -hmm. 
So thanks for tuning in. You got anything else? Good work, everybody. No, thanks for watching us and and uh, see you next call week. us. Yeah, see you next week at the World Show. Come one, come all. It's going to be a huge, huge thing. Mandy has poured her little heart into this production, oh and it's going to be a production. It's not <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, and we will catch you next week.